that we have the concepts of health, disease, and death under our belts, or at least we've become initially familiarized with them enough to proceed. We're going to turn to our next portion, which will talk about causation and kinds. We'll talk about reductionism and holism and controversial diseases. We'll begin with controversial diseases and then kind of work our way backwards in this lecture video. Uh, we'll focus on the distinction between a disease and a disorder or a disease and a syndrome. We'll talk about culture specific or culturally based diseases. Um, we'll talk about psychiatric diseases or disorders where addiction falls within this conversation. We'll also talk about a term called medicalization or where we medicalize certain terms. And that is, uh, according to the book, when normal human traits get uh, in inaptly brought into the scope of medical attention. We also have disease creep, another term we might not be familiar with. Now this does not mean a disease that stalks you on the internet and uh, memorizes your work schedule and your route and then just hides in your bushes. But maybe we can build on that metaphor because according to the book, uh, disease creep occurs when standards for uh, diagnosing a disorder become uh, easier and easier to meet, rendering more and more people diagnosable with the disease to the point where healthy people are diagnosed with a disease when they should not. So fun terms to go over uh, and then we'll we'll delve into notions of reality, what counts as a real disease, uh, what prejudices, what measures, which, what theories uh, goes into our delineations of those types and kinds of, of reality, what will count, what will not count, who it is we're going to take seriously, and we'll look into the history of some diseases to, to, to note the evolution of uh, sin to disease to life pattern, lifestyle, life choice. Oh, you'll see. Buckle up! It'll be fun. So let's begin by asking, what makes a disease real? Uh, we need to categorize diseases as real or unreal or as an urgent matter or not an urgent matter. Um, and within the philosophy of medicine, we begin to delineate a taxonomy of disease and what counts as disease, what conditions must be met in order for something to be called a disease. We must set up a nosology. Make sure I'm spelling that correctly. Nosology is the study of disease classification. And mostly it seems from the book that within this field, we use a little bit of naturalism or a lot of bit of naturalism when it comes to defining what counts as a real disease. Uh, philosophers want to categorize things based on natural kinds. Um, so the, the, the division, again, uh, with naturalism, we want to base our judgments, our diagnoses, our, um, our delineations, our taxonomy based on real distinctions. I'm holding my page over here on this side. Distinctions in nature. That's an A. So real distinctions in nature. Now, from the phenomenological standpoint, once we get there, whoo, this, this, um, this definition will, will be problematic. In the meanwhile, let's roll with it. Uh, so the, the real natural kind, um, as we see on page 81, uh, some kinds, some types of things, categories, have a natural existence independently of us. 
consider the element gold. Anything with an atomic number of 79 is gold, and it will share all the same properties as all other gold. In its pure form, it will be slightly yellow, dense, malleable, and it will melt at 1,064 uh, degrees Celsius and boil at 2,907 degrees Celsius. These properties of gold hold true at all times and places in which the air pressure is one standard atmosphere, Sideris Paribus. In other words, the kind gold, the type of thing called gold, all gold has some essential properties and those properties are natural. In contrast, consider the game chess. All games of chess share certain properties. The game is played between two people who start with 16 pieces each and the game follows certain rules. Like the kind gold, the kind chess has some essential properties, but these properties depend entirely on us. We invented chess, thus those properties are not natural. We did not invent gold, the earth did, I guess, and uh, we invented chess. So in areas of philosophy, we have this distinction between an artifact, which is something human made, and then this natural distinction. And so the author here, the field of philosophy of medicine here, has agreed that uh, artifacts are not natural kinds because what makes something real is not that humans made it, but that um, nature made it. Now, I take issue with this notion of reality and nature and how we are basing a taxonomy off of it because are we not natural beings who create chess? Why, why can't chess be a natural phenomenon, something that is real, that holds real value? Why can't we think about the nature of chess? Don't we uh, delineate the types of moves that each piece could make based on the natural kind that each piece is? The rook is a kind of chess piece. It is distinct from the queen. The queen has properties. The, 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 the knight or the rook or whatever it is I referenced just, just a moment ago, and I've already forgotten. Thank you, ADHD, which I'm going to say is real. Each of those chess pieces has a, is a kind, has an essence, possesses different properties from the other. So this naturalism, this real distinction in nature, problematic, but let's just try to roll with the author what they're saying um, for the sake of argument and then we can return to those nitty gritty distinctions because they will help us overcome or at least understand better some of the uh, problems that arise here. Okay, so now that we have to dis have discussed um, the distinction between an artifact as a type of kind and what is considered a real distinction in nature, the author also talks about a, a category of beauty. So I'm glad he brought aesthetics into it, and I'm glad that I started with aesthetics in the last video. Um, he writes, finally consider the category beautiful music. Obviously, the existence of music depends on human activity. So unlike gold, its properties cannot be all natural. So I guess we have here in music a bit of a mix of human-made and real sounds that physical objects can make. Anyways, moreover, there is no essential feature that music must have in order to be beautiful. Some beautiful music is harmonic but not rhythmic. Some beautiful music is rhythmic but not harmonic. Some has singing, some doesn't. As a drummer, as a musician, I want to say that all music has rhythm. He even mentions John Cage who wrote uh, a piece titled 433, so four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. That is metered silence. There's a beginning and an end to that piece. There is a rhythm to the silence. There is rhythm to rests. Um, 
anyway, so I would say that all music must be rhythmic uh, in nature. Um, anyways, so this, what he ends up saying at the bottom of that paragraph on page 81, most importantly because beauty is in the eye of the beholder, people will disagree about which particular pieces of music ought to be considered beautiful music. And again, remember just how much taste goes into the decisions that we make. Are we a little, uh, made a little squeamish by blood? Well, that's going to affect how we treat a patient who's bleeding everywhere or, or bruised or uh, whatever it might be the problem with blood. It might be coming out of places where it should not. So if you have any uh, um, fears or trepidation or any uh, cut, what's the word, what's the word, what's the word? If you have any inhibitions about approaching a bloody situation, that might, uh, should cut. Remember how much taste goes into uh, our delineation of diseases. Is a disease uh, determined so because it's, it's ugly? certain uh, mental disorders, or what we might consider a mental disorder in other cultures serves a, a sacred purpose and, and we wouldn't consider that an illness. Um, so is a disorder, a disorder within a culture because um, we find it socially repugnant, because that behavior gets in the way of being productive in a way that capitalism might expect us to be, uh, so on and so forth. So it's good that he brought up beauty um, as a distinction because whether we like to admit it or not, what it is we are attracted to, what um, harmonizes with our beliefs and our social practices plays a role in our judgments and our diagnoses uh, and our experiences as patients and as practitioners. Um, so I, wanted, I want to address some things I disagree with uh, here. I think music here, um, especially when you think about um, a natural kind, what about bird song? Is it the case that there is no such thing as music without humanity there? Um, yes, maybe we construe that bird song if, as music, so the human concept of music is tied into our experience of bird song, and so maybe there isn't a natural kind, a, a taxonomy of, of sounds in nature beyond our experience of it, but daggone it! Maybe the birds experience their song as sound. Maybe they're singing hymns to the heavens or to the trees. Sure, maybe some of their song is practical and serves purposes, but who knows? The birds might be sitting there like, yeah, this hits, that slaps. Uh. Um, so again, this distinction between taste and a natural kind, and the distinction between what human cognition brings to the table and distinguishing what's a real distinction in nature and what is not. Oh, so Kant, in his third critique, has a conception of uh, beauty that allows for objective measure. We have um, within uh, a judgment that something is beautiful. Well, that's a judgment based off taste. However, in judgments of beauty, there is a sort of objectivity there. Whenever we say that is beautiful, we mean that anybody who sees that ought to find it beautiful. And so, check out that video on, on uh, the notion of freedom and Kant that we have, but we can um, bring that judgment into the sphere of universal inspection of the categorical imperative. Um, it is, it, uh, judgments are more than, about beauty, more than just maxims, um, but we can, um, we can be directed to universal conditions and truths and order and connection through judgments about beauty. So is, uh, is beauty something man-made or is there something connecting us to nature uh, that allows us to ascend to a universal third-person perspective or at least something within our nature? Kant doesn't give us much of a, 
much room to explore the relationship between the uh, noumenal realm and the phenomenal realm, or the, the world as it exists in and of itself without our being here to interpret it and how it is we experience the world. Um, but anyways, the, there are instances in beauty where we find objective order and it's important that we explore these aesthetic concerns as we explore nosology, as we understand what a real distinction in nature is, uh, where artifacts come into play uh, as a real distinction. Do not artifacts help us to distinguish what is real in nature and what is just an abstract you know, delineation? Um, do we not create microscopes? Um, to help us diagnose real distinctions. Well, we've used something artificial in order to discover that real distinction has the taint of the artificialness, tainted the reality of the distinction that we find. Hmm. What about man-made gold? Uh, to, to go back to that distinction, oh my goodness. I'd like to make one more um, reference to uh, music theory and the history of philosophy and its relation to scientific objective measure, uh, Descartes, and I, I, I said this in the video on Descartes, so go back and watch that one too, but I'm so excited about it, I'm going to tell it again, um, that we each uh, um, experience a, a note that is played differently. If an A chord is strummed, you know, my imagination might come up with a, a a, a uni unicorn world, whereas you might be transported to a devil world by hearing that A chord, whatever. Our imagination is tickled differently, our experiences, our interests, whatever else is going on in there, uh, provides a different experience of that same note. However, the essence of the note is determined not by any sort of uh, physical property, um, it has nothing to do with reverberations in eardrums and nervous systems. It has to do with the mathematical ratio between the, the note and all possible notes within a series. It relates back to Pythagoras' is monochord. Anyways, so even though we're experiencing something different, when we hear that note, we're all understanding the mathematical, universal, objective essence, property even, an essence and property of that note. And so when we say that note is beautiful, we're referencing an ancient beauty of harmony, of mathematical ratio. And again, this comes into play in how it is we distinguish real distinctions in nature. What harmonizes with our worldview, with our social practices? Um, of course, we'll get into this with culture-bound diseases, but this problem of nosology will um, carry us through the, the whole lecture here as we talk about um, addiction, the history of women's health, um, and this medicalization as well as disease creep. So, so if you are buckled up at this point, you better buckle up now, because we're gonna we're gonna get into the nitty gritty. I want to say one more thing about nosology, and then I swear I'll move on. And actually, I'm gonna go on one big tangent and then come back around the back door to the book. I promise it's gonna be worth the ride. Nosology, this science of categorizing different diseases, distinguishing diseases from syndromes and disorders, where we're going to justify our categorizations based on the naturalistic assumptions behind it, that, that we're looking for real distinctions in nature, distinctions that are real in nature, not something artificial that we human beings come up with, but real distinctions in nature. My goodness, well, what of real distinctions in nature? Hmm. Clearly, this is something distinct from fake or imaginary distinctions in 
nature. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we might even distinguish that between uh, nonsensical distinctions in nature. I spelled that one all the way out. Anyways, what is our evidence for a real distinction from nature? Hmm. Is this distinguished in nature? Does this distinction between types of distinction arise in nature? Can we see it? Can we point to it? Or is it something virtual, man-made? Mm. Um, now, this sort of naturalistic take is going to typically rely on a physicalism where uh, this material, physical reality um, is the foundation for experiential knowledge um, and we can understand the mind in terms of uh, its physical foundations and properties. Um, <clears throat> why? Why do we choose this real distinction over these others? Well, of course, this one will yield uh, more precise results about reality, or at least the reality we'd like to know about this body and its physiological makeup and all the magic that goes on inside. Uh, but real, what definition of real are we talking about? What do we mean by nature? Why are we choosing nature to mean purely physical properties? Could there be a, 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 an essence of a nature or a logic, a natural law, if you will? Reality, what counts as real, especially if we are going to take seriously social conditions? Um, how is it that anxiety is induced by something that isn't real? Money, my goodness. Um, so, whew, it's not real, but it is. It is very real uh, and shapes our condition. So what Husserl, the founding father of phenomenology, would have us do is explore the motivations for choosing the definitions of reality that we do, the presumptions about nature, which are causal, um, which um, might involve you know, a certain hierarchy of um, measures such as necessity, um, direction, you, uh, uh, uh. and Husserl, the founding father of phenomenology, would ask us, why do we choose the definition of reality that we do uh, whenever we are exploring our, our uh, belief systems and ideas and um, dispositions, how they determine our judgments about very real and critical situations that require clear judgments, the best judgment. Um, so why do we define physical reality in, in, in the way that we do? Um, you know, what are our motivations for defining nature as we do? It's not so obvious what nature is. Um, you know, think about um, natural selection. Survival of the fittest, perhaps. We well, could have altruism there. It doesn't need to be dog eat dog. Uh, survival of the fittest, but how are we adapting to our environment and evolving so that we can carry on our species? So that we can. Because there's always a purpose behind the naturalistic uh, portrayal of nature itself, especially in the Western uh, canon. There are other ways of exploring nature. So who's role would want to detangle um, our naturalistic attitude where we have a causal uh, um, me mechanical notion of nature. And even in the history of Western philosophy, we have distinctions that are about nature that are not mechanical. <sighs> Sorry, I, I'm fired up. I'm riled up about reality. <sighs> so, uh, what, what are our motivations for choosing what we do? We have uh, this naturalistic uh, causal framework. Uh, all of reality uh, uh, can be reduced to this physical world of objects that we can walk around and manipulate. Um, you know, and then our psyche is determined by those physical means. And oh, lo and behold, psychology under the spell of naturalistic assumptions uh, is unable to capture the nature of 
conscious life. Uh, so he organizes the web of belief, uh, the doxic state of affairs of uh, this framework. Or he calls it an attitude. He calls it the natural attitude. And within the science, it becomes the naturalistic attitude. Uh, and when we justify our reasoning based on this attitude alone without exploring our motivations for defining reality as we do, for defining nature as we do, uh, then we are, number one, lazy sciences, and number two, we could be uh, doing some real damage if our prejudices do not harmonize with the task at hand, with the context in which there is a task at hand, uh, and which might prevent us from caring for our patients. So let's go down this phenomenological uh, rabbit hole where we suspend our judgments from the natural attitude, how we typically take reality, how we typically understand a person, how we typically understand a body, which is physical and material and mechanistic, but mm, which we must care for. How must oh, we can look at the body in a different way? Um, so let's let's suspend those judgments. We won't get rid of them. We want to see the relationship between our motivations, our active choices, and willing and judgments. Uh, how they relate to uh, our typical judgments and how they relate to other ideals and other judgments that we might could take up. South came out. So uh, we're going to take on a transcendental phenomenological attitude so that we can see for ourselves, bear witness to that relationship within the noematic content. So I'm going on and on and on. I will, I will come back to this uh, in just a second. Uh, we're going to turn our attention to the history of diagnosing women to illustrate just why it's important to make these terribly fine distinctions and to question what is so obviously fact, what, real distinctions in nature. How on earth could I go on for as long as I have about how this could possibly be questioned? Oh, you'll know. So I will be pulling from this article from the National Library of Medicine, Women in Hysteria in the History of Mental Health. And while this exploration of hysteria will uh, begin in the realm of mental health, there are so many ramifications for physical health and women um, when we look at this history. Okay, so this abstract reads, hysteria is undoubtedly the first mental disorder attributable to women. Accurately described in the second millennium BC and until Freud, considered an exclusively female disease. Thank you, Freud, for that at least. Over 4,000 years of history, this disease was considered from two perspectives, scientific and demonological perspectives with an S. It was cured with herbs, sex or sexual abstinence, punished and purified with fire for its association with sorcery, and finally clinically studied as a disease and treated with innovative therapies. However, even at the end of the 19th century, scientific innovation had still not reached some places. Uh, during the 20th century, several studies postulated the decline of hysteria amongst occidental patients, both women and men, and the escalating of this disorder in non-Western countries. So we'll talk about this uh, uh, socially, culturally distinct disease uh, a little later. The concept of hysterical neurosis is deleted with the 1980 DSM. Three, the evolution of these diseases seems to be a factor linked with social westernization and examining under what conditions the symptoms first became common in different societies became a priority for recent studies over risk factor. Okay, so what I want to do uh, is, is go back and forth between the demonology aspect and um, the scientific facts, the distinctions made by nature, the real distinctions made by nature. So let's let's go all the way back to the beginning of time. No, 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 I don't mean the Big Bang. I mean Genesis, Adam and Eve. Think of that story. God created Adam and Eve. Well, during one tale of Genesis, we have Eve made from his rib and to serve as his partner, as his 
inferior. She is seduced by a demon, Satan, and she eats of the fruit, and oh no, now humanity is cursed, and so she is punished with the pain of childbirth and uterus issues. Uh, the, the, the Greek term um, being uh, Esther. I don't know we spelled it over here. Oh, yeah. Uh, here, that's an R. That's an A. That's an E with a little thing over it. Okay. Um, so, problems with the womb. Eve is cursed with that. And so we get this um, intermingling of hysteria, women issues, and demonology. And throughout the history of Western science, though we see a progression of ideas, that connection remains, I would argue to this day, tightly intertwined. Okay, uh, well, let's go back to this, um, let's go back to this article here. So, again, we have Eve rep uh, 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 represented as serving a, a purpose to serve Adam. There's patriarchy there as well. Um, let's keep in mind the demonology and the, the purpose. When we get to the uh, 17th and 18th century, uh, a trend of thought that delegated to the women a social mission started developing. Um, so out of a, a natural understanding of women and their purpose we 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 get another detail of this disease that afflicts women that, that they are hysterical irrational if you will erratic uh, that's important to note too the, the the association with masculinity and reason and emotionless judgment and women with uh, hysteria that goes back not only to Eve and to Lilith, but with the fall of Sophia. I won't go on that tangent. I won't go on that tangent. We go back to the article. If from a moral, a moral point of view, she finds redemption in material sacrifice that redeems the soul, but it does not re rehabilitate the body. From the social point of view, the woman takes a specific role. In 1774. Five. The physician philosopher Pierre Roussel published uh, the treatise uh, Système physique et morale de la femme. Pardon my pronunciation. Uh, greatly influenced by the ideas of Jean Jacques Rousseau. Femininity is for both authors an essential nature, a real distinction from nature with defined functions. Here we have the sexes being defined by function, a social function, not only a natural function to bear children, but there's a social element as well that will help sediment this link to irrational behaviors, the uterus and women as a concept. Uh, the excesses of civilization causes uh, disruption in the women as well as the moral and physiological imbalance. So femininity is for both authors an essential nature with defined functions and the disease. Hysteria is explained by the non-fulfillment of natural desire, more so than just fulfilling that, that urge. There's a deeper urge, a social purpose to serve, as well as the purpose of bearing children. So the excesses of civilization causes disruption in the women, as well as moral and physiological imbalance. The identified um, by doctors in hysteria. Uh, I read funny. The afflictions, diseases, and depravity of women result from the breaking away from the normal, natural functions. Um, who is determining function? Men in the patriarchy in the 17th and 18th century in Western Europe. Do you think the women had a say in what their function was, what their role was? No. No, they did not. Um, so we see um, 
even taken out of a religious context, in a secular context of society. We have women serving a role and to uh, perform the sin of stepping away from that role, from that function, from that logos, from that pure judgment, um, the, then, then depravity and disease. So here we have disease defined socially, physiologically. We see a behaviorism at play where we look at a woman and she's erratic and we go, oh my gosh, there must be a disease with her. It wasn't as if some man who had no idea what he was talking about tried to lecture her about her area of expertise in academia and then got upset when his nose was rubbed in it. You know, she's hysterical. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Anyways, 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 let's, let's go back. Following natural determinism, doctors can find the break the, uh, can find the woman within the boundaries of a specific role she is a mother and a guardian of virtue for the state for the republic uh, in this context the woman witch appears more and more an artifice to secure the social order of an ancient regime yeah uh, so we see that that demonology there even in this secular uh, space in the 18th century, hysteria starts being gradually associated with the brain rather than the uterus, a trend which opens the way to neurological etiology. If it is connected to the brain, then perhaps hysteria is not a female disease and can affect both sexes. Anybody can be irrational, especially those of the lower class. Why do they behave the way that they do? Oh my gosh. Do you see the elitism and the patriarchy at play in defining disease? Um, we've gone from physical uterus to brain, but by that we mean the mind, so more than just the brain. We're talking about personhood, we're talking about uh, purpose, and again, this is why I brought up Darwinism, even there in the most bare factual perspective where we're ignoring the religious context in which we are practicing science. Even if we're in our laboratory and around folks who are atheists, it doesn't mean the country that we're studying in isn't defined by some sort of religious tell us, my goodness. Uh, so to ignore that and, and just look at nature as it is, that's an ideal, that is an ideal perspective and we should strive to achieve it in certain contexts. But my goodness, we're talking about the 18th century, uh, 1700s, we're still moving on. It's not until Freud that both sexes can have hysteria. And what, what is the meaning of hysteria? Well, that someone wasn't a robot? My goodness. Okay, so I'm fired up. Again, I'm fired up. I'm fired up. Purposiveness. Who is defining what the purpose is? Um, let us stop and suspend our judgments based on our conception of the purpose of nature as Kant calls us to do as well. And well, whose role will allow us to explore the motivations uh, for our judging in the way that we do? What sort of biases, what sort of affair, belief affair complexes do we have going on? Oh, in the contemporary age. All right, so we're getting into the 1800s. French neuropsychiatrist Pierre Genet with the sponsorship of J.M. Charcot opened a laboratory in Paris's Sepulture. I butchered that. I did. I stand by it. He convinced doctors that hypnosis, based on suggestion and dissociation, was a very powerful model for investigation and therapy. He wrote that hysteria is the result of the very idea the patient has of his accident. The patient's own idea of pathology is translated into a physical disability. Hysteria is a pathology in which the dissociation appears autonomously for neurotic reasons and in such a way as to adversely disturb the individual's everyday life. Janet studied five, Janet, I'm so sorry, <laughs> studied five hysteria symptoms, anesthesia, amnesia, abulia, motor control diseases, and modification of character. <laughs> that bitch was seeing red. <laughs> Uh, the reason of hysteria is in the edifice that is the subconscient or subconscious for what concerns eroticism, 
Sinead noted that the hysterical are, in general, not any more erotic than a normal person. Uh, Janae's studies are very important for the early theories of Freud, Brewer, and Carl Jung. The father of psychoanalysis, here we go, Sigmund Freud, provides a contribution that leads to the psychological theory of hysteria and the assertion of male hysteria. Freud himself wrote in 1897, after a period of good humor, I now have a crisis of unhappiness. The chief patient I am worried about today is myself, my little hysteria which was much enhanced by work, took a step forward. In 1889, he pub published his studies on hysteria with Joseph Brewer. The key concept of his psychoanalytical theory, the influence of childhood sexual fantasies and the different ways of thinking of the unconscious mind have not yet been formulated, but they are already implicit in this text. Among the cases presented, we find the hysteria of the young uh, Katerina, who suffers from Globus Hystericus. Mm. The text does not refer to the famous Oedipus complex, which emerges through the study of male hysteria, um, developed after this treatise, so on and so forth. I am going to skip the rest. Here we go. Um, so now, uh, again, the, 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 the term has been, since the 80s, uh, uh, redacted from, removed from the DSM. Uh, but think about the ramifications. Women's pain, is it taken seriously or are we just saying, oh, they're hysterical? That term hysterical has come to mean so much more than uterus problems. So much so that when women have terrible uterus problems, excruciating pain, they go to the doctor and they say, oh, you're, you're, you're fine. You're just being hysterical. It's some pain. It's some pain. It's, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Um, get over it. Uh, overlooking serious diseases uh, and issues. Um, endometriosis, that was the word I was looking for, is so often overlooked and women um, have a much harder time of getting diagnosed uh, than taken seriously. My uh, diagnosis took 12 years to get because my pain was not taken seriously. I mean, when I'm having bowel spasms, when I'm in a flare, I'm on the bathroom floor, I cannot move, I'm in so much pain. Um, and if, if I can't stop uh, re releasing fluids, I need to be taken to the hospital, I get so dehydrated. Um, someone has to carry me. It's, it's a mess, or I like inch my way to the door. And I've, I've had so many uh, doctors uh, just kind of push me around literally and say that you know I'm just faking it or oh it's not that bad or oh you're just trying to get some pain pills no my gosh um so it, it took a while to be taken seriously for my pain why I was just being hysterical you know no stomach issue creates that much pain so that you can't even move yeah but as soon as you throw the term ulcerative colitis on there all of a sudden you get um taken a little more seriously I had a student uh, and I, that, we talked about that, uh, shared some experiences, brought that up. Um, oh my goodness. It's nice when you can relate. Uh, I'm glad my oversharing is leading to uh, some insight and some interest in the, in the, the, uh, the topic here. Um, so my goodness, I think that we need to go further than uh, real distinctions in nature when it comes to examining the taxonomy of disease, the categories that we have, what counts as a disease, uh, if it is a disease, what type of disease is it? Is it conditioned by something social? Is it conditioned by something pathological? Is it conditioned by substance abuse? Is it is it genetic? You know, all these different foundations, sure. Um, what, what goes into consideration? Um, because this, it, I mean, it took 4,000 years for hysteria to finally be removed from um, the, the, the official uh, the official book. Um, why? Because of moral considerations that were influenced by by money and patriarchy and religion. Um, my goodness, uh, and those. You know, we are human beings who are practicing medicine or who are experiencing medical emergencies. And our personal biases, our upbringing, they're going to come into play in real time. 
Um, so while I do believe in rigorous scrutiny, I also believe in, you know, if you are doing the work of reflecting and truly caring for your patients um, and checking your biases, just do the best that you can because we can't help but be a medium for the, the, the larger forces at play in society and whatever else forces are at play. Mercury might be in retrograde. I don't know. Um, so let's, after that, uh, wild ride return to the terms of the book that I'm supposed to be sharing with you. Hello there. My uh, film disappeared. So half of this video, the content's gone. So I'm just gonna go to the book. <laughs> Page 67, holism and reductionism. Uh, in the last chapter, we saw that much of medicine aims to understand diseases in terms of microphysiological parts and processes. This is reductionism about medicine. Medical reductionism holds that diseases should be understood in the finest grain way possible by defining diseases according to the abnormal microphysiological parts and processes that constitute diseases and that medical interventions should target those microphysiological parts and processes. It gives an example. I love the examples in philosophy textbooks. They are always off the wall. <laughs> the example of neurosyphilis as an infection by a bacterium and its treatment with a specific chemical is a successful example of reductionism in medicine. So here we are assuming a naturalism, a physicalism, uh, that we can reduce uh, a phenomenon to its natural causes, uh, natural facts in nature, of course, uh, presumed here as well. We'll get into all sorts of critiques of naturalism in other videos. Um, however, reductionism in medicine, much like I believe physicalism in general, ignores the broader context in which disease or whatever phenomenon arises, uh, such as social and economic contexts. Medical reductionism has failed to develop effective treatments for a wide range of diseases. Reductionism is associated with viewing patients as mere bodies to be intervened on rather than people to be cared for. Prepositions are important, y'all. Uh, an alternative view is called holism. In medicine, holism is a view of diseases, interventions, and patients that attempts to remedy these reductionist shortcomings. Holism considers the object of medical intervention as the whole person rather than a particular disease entity. Uh, now, we don't want to confuse, conflate, whatever, holism with new age um, medicine or alternative medicines um, that folks might uh, champion on, the, what's it, the, the mothers, mothers, who is that? No, I'm, I'm just going, we're going to be more relaxed. Who is that? Mother... Jones, Mother Jones, Mother Jones stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, we want to not fall into um, an anti-vax sort of uh, uh, situation here with holism. Holism takes into consideration, of course, your, your corporeal being, your mechanisms, abnormalities as they present according to blood work standards and statistics. Uh, you know, but we, we also want to take into consideration the whole person, their uh, history, their background, uh, their traumas, whatever else might play a role in the presentation of any disease. Um, I will say my ulcerative colitis is hard to pin down because the typical inflammation markers that they look for in determining uh certain autoimmune expressions of ulcerative colitis. Well, they just don't show up on my blood work. Uh, you can see with your eyeballs that there's ulcerated mucosa and blood. 
uh, but you take a biopsy and the panels aren't aren't very revealing. Um, so there is some other autoimmune thing going on that needs to be pinned down. Um, it's it it pops up whenever there is stress. Um, so even if the biomarkers are not there, when you take a holistic approach and you say, well, you know, so and so just died, such and such bill is unfair. Uh, there's a, a ridiculous life event. Well, of course you're sick right now. Uh, let's let's treat the symptoms uh, and let's do what we can to relax and get over whatever life event is the true cause of this expression. You know. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's holism and reductions. That's all you need to know, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> For this introduction, medicalization, people suffer in many ways on page one, or uh, on page regular 83. Medicine can sometimes alleviate such suffering. When a form of suffering is brought under the gaze of medicine, one might think that this is a positive development. Why not help people however we can, including with the use of tools that medicine has at its, its, its disposal? However, sometimes folks can get overdiagnosed. Um, and when, so, when, a, when a disease becomes so familiar that folks are self-diagnosing um, and you have whole Instagram life revolving around such a diagnosis, uh, we, can, we can get the medicalization of a disease. Uh, sometimes scientists, companies, and patient advocacy groups urge medical organizations and regulators to take, take more seriously a condition that is not yet recognized as a legitimate disease. I remember celiac disease. Um, well, of course, at the time, uh, this is uh, late aughts-ish, uh, celiac disease was was taken more seriously on a, on a grander scale. Now, of course, there were practitioners who uh, took it seriously. I had a friend, uh, an undergrad, who, who had it. She had special meals at the dining hall made for her. Um, uh, and it was starting to become more popular. And, you know, some folks who were, didn't have celiacs would get, get the, the special meal. I'm like, girl, how do you feel about that? Was what She said, well, you know, while... Some folks might take advantage. It's good to have a, a visibility for this. Uh, and food for my disease is really hard to find. Um, and it's expensive. So the more visibility there is and the more folks buy into it, then, it, you know, the better it is for me, really, and those who who suffer, who suffer truly. Um, working in the, in the restaurant biz for a while, I saw a Folks who were not suffering truly, asking for all sorts of accommodations, which are annoying. Um, but it did help raise awareness for celiac disease, even though it's become so medicalized that, uh, as the author writes on page eighty-three, critics claim, however, that the very uh, that very often the medicalization of otherwise normal aspects of life, even painful aspects that involve suffering is unwarranted and can lead to nefarious consequences. Um, you know, you got a little tummy pain. It might be a normal aspect of life. It might not be that you have a gluten allergy. It might be that you have too much sugar and caffeine and stress in your life. Uh, and you read somewhere that, uh, you know, all this bloating could be bread, it could be the gluten. I don't know. Anyways, so then you, you take yourself, you put yourself on this special diet that could lead to nefarious consequences if you're not working with a dietitian. Um, you know, I, I went on in the video at great lengths before the film was deleted about ADHD. Um, how uh, a lot of folks who might have it, the, the statistics are, 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 I mean that this this is on the rise uh, with with the, the rise of social media uh, and with um, you know just our life in front of screens. Um, we're go go go. We're we're isolated more and more uh, in society, and so uh, we've got ADHD on the rise. I'm trying to pull up the page that I was reading from. Let's see. Oh no, that was. Was not it? That was not it. 
para 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 um 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 oh here we go the tab that says ADHD <laughs> ADHD diagnostic trends increased recognition or overdiagnosis once again from the National Library of Medicine. The prevalence of ADHD attention De deficit hyperactivity disorder has seen a consistent rise in recent years. These numbers spark a debate over the reason for the observed trends with some concerned about overdiagnosis and overprescription of stimulant medications and others raising the issue of diagnostic disparities, particularly in underrepresented populations. Uh, so this this is a little more serious in terms of nefarious consequences than uh, getting the gluten free option at D Hall. Um, you know, do you have ADHD? Maybe. Have you tried stepping away from the screen, cutting out caffeine, getting good exercise, sleeping well? You know. Have we tried all this? If so, sure, let's go here. But I think there is some over prescription there. Um, there is, I don't know if it's right now or if it was just recently, there was a Adderall shortage. It was causing folks uh, some, some issues. Now I, I have ADHD, something bad. I call it drummer brain, but that's what, that's the medical term for it, ADHD. I, given my stomach issues, I cannot, I cannot handle uh, ADHD medication. Um, I, I don't know if you can see in the background, I've got a clock, I've got this calendar up here, I've got my, my written calendar, I've got alarms, I've got that clock up there, and you can set a timer on it, and it, it rings really loudly so that if you are in a completely different room, you can, you, you know that it's time to go get the laundry. Um, you know, I am scatterbrained, clearly. If you sit and watch a lecture of mine, my God, it's on display. You, I, I can manage. I can manage. Now, some folks are worse off than me and just really can't. Whatever their stomach conditions are, they just can't. But I know folks who really don't need that medication. Uh, um, their doctor kind of just gave it to them to make them go away because they said the right thing. And if they don't give them the medication after what they said, then they might get in trouble. Uh, so that's something to think about as well. Um, uh, so what do you do? Um, now, I mentioned Instagram kind of flippantly earlier. You know, there are folks who, like my friend with celiacs, want to get the word out there, who want to raise awareness for this condition so the folks can be more understanding and accommodating um, and so that folks can better advocate for themselves uh, and, and just to, to, to know that they're not alone to have a community. Um, however, weaponized illness is a real thing. <laughs> I think that folks sometimes just need to step away from social media and just take, take a walk, get some fresh air and take accountability and responsibility for themselves. Uh, anyways, uh, I will link all of the web websites for this for this lecture here. Um, the past couple of decades have seen a continuous increase in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder diagnosis diagnoses. Now, is that because we're better at diagnosing folks, or is it because there's an actual you know, on the rise. Well, national population surveys reflect an increase of the prevalence from 6.1 to 10.2% in the 20 year period from 1997 to 2016. And experts continue to debate and disagree on the causes for this trend. On the one hand, while there are children whose diagnoses are irrefutable and undeniably require treatment, some experts worry about the risk of overdiagnosis and subsequent overprescription of stimulants and other psychotropics. Um, oh my goodness. So I will substitute from time to time, supplement my adjunct pennies and I'll, I'll end up in kindergarten. And I can't tell you how many parents send with their hyperactive child who needs medication will send with this child and their lunch for snack, you know, uh, a large Gatorade 
and sugary, hyper, uh, hyper, what's it called? Uh, produce, produced, hyper, I don't know. It's just not even food they're sending their children in with. Uh, the kids are not getting good sleep and there's very little order at home. It's like, well, do we need to diagnose this child with ADHD and, and give them drugs? Let's take, if we were to take a completely reductionist stance, for example, uh, we might say, yes, we're just looking at normal behavior. This child is more active than normal. Uh, there's an attention deficit there. Um, you know, we can, we can point to the chemical imbalances and we can address that with medication. Or do we take a more holistic approach and, um, look at the lifestyle of a child, what it is that their parents are sending in for snack and lunch. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, let's continue reading. Like with most psychotropic medications, treatment consideration needs to be carefully weighed with regard to potential adverse outcomes. For stimulants, there is also concern for diversion and misuse of medication for performance enhancement rather than for treatment. Um, now, kids with ADHD, um, even if it's a mild to moderate case how much of that is just this kid has a lot of energy um and and perhaps uh you know needs some more recess for heaven's sakes is the standard of normality set with the thought in mind that we just need a calm classroom right um and we do need a calm classroom my goodness um, but at what cost sometimes I wonder, um, you know, since the pandemic, uh, behaviors as, as we say in, in the, the teacher world have, have gone up and we see a rise with ADHD. Um, but we also see a rise in parents having to work 10,000 jobs, both parents, or if there's one parent, 10,000 jobs, uh, the kids not getting the food that they need or the sleep that they need. Um, the pandemic threw everybody off. So now we have a classroom with more behaviors than not, you know, students uh, having behaviors than, than not. And it, it really is a struggle just to keep the classroom quiet. And those students who are uh, getting what they need at home and are there to focus and to learn um, come home just as exhausted as the teachers uh, trying to keep the peace because the bulk of classroom time is trying to keep piece at this point um now you look at that from a holistic point and and you think my the, the solution is not medication the solution is making sure that families have all the resources that they need um the, the solution is making sure the parents have all of the mental health uh needs their needs met and financial needs of child care met my gosh um you know, that the, the substance abuse counselors uh, and, and help is readily available, that mental health services are not stigmatized. Um, let's just give the kids uh, school lunch and breakfast and snack. Let's uh, pass legislation that that food has to actually be nutritious food. Um, <laughs> let's step away from the screens a bit because especially with, with the younger kids, they need they, they don't need to be learning from a screen solely. Um, yeah, life is is about to be uh, digitized uh, to the max, but we need kids to know what's real. What's sense perception is the foundation for higher ordered cognitive stuff. You need kids need sensory. Kids need sensory stuff. Um, so let's let's step away from the screens. Let's all step away from the screens. Um, and then if, if <laughs> we need medication, then we need medication. Oh my goodness. So, um, page 84 critics of medicalization note that too often the underlying motive for medicalization is the financial profit of companies that manufacture interventions for the condition being medicalized or the financial profit of professionals responsible for treatment. For, for treating the condition, my goodness. Um, and we also have to think about um, 
uh, underrepresented folks. Uh, on the other hand, from our, let, now let's return back to our, to our article. Here it is, the ADHD. On the other hand, diagnostic disparities and underdiagnosis exist in various communities, including women and underrepresented minorities. Um, this article seeks to better understand this, that, and the other. Um, yeah, so on the one hand, we have, an, with medicalization, we have an over diagnosis of one population at the expense of, of another population almost. Part of the issue is um, uh, just as women are not taken seriously in the medical field because of societal conditioning um, and, you know, these very subtle biases. Um, same with, with um, folks, uh, uh, people of color, folks of different backgrounds culturally, who come from different folks. I mean, I'm just thinking as an American who, who, who has, you know, been through so many medical situations and has seen so much, um, you know, here we have so many, we're supposed to be a melting pot, um, but so often you see folks uh, treated differently because of the color of their skin or their background or their sexual uh, orientation or their gender identity. Um, and, you know, the medical field, the, 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 the space in which it's practiced is not a vacuum. Science is not practiced in a vacuum. Uh, biases, uh, religious beliefs, upbringing, all of that bleeds into our judgment and our motivations for our actions and our evaluations and how it is we reflect upon ourselves. We have blind spots, um, even the most woke of us, you know? Uh, so woo, there's also controversy around psychiatric diseases um, that are not taken seriously, um, not just ADHD, but, um, you know, think about uh, just how depression affects the physical body, my goodness. Um, pain, it's, it's, some, it's so, I am bipolar and I can become psychotically depressed and that is very painful. The dog just died um, and uh, my body feels heavy. This is the first day that I haven't just like sobbed, really. And my body feels heavy. Um, my goodness. Uh, so how do you treat that? I mean, yeah, let's, let's, let's clean, clean ourselves up. Let's, you know, try to drum, try to move, try to, you know, get, get, get our work done so it doesn't pile up. Um, you know, and, and eventually this, this too shall pass, but uh, that pain is not all the time taken seriously. The, the physical uh, the physio, uh, what's it called? Is it physiological? Psychosomatic. The psychosomatic um, uh, issues at play in psychiatric disease. Um, let's see. Oh, also here, he writes on page 87, for example, for example, consider the alleged disease premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which was added to the DSM-5 in 2013. This is an especially harmful version of premenstrual syndrome, symptoms including uh, irritability, depression, mood, lability, anxiety, and fatigue, and physical symptoms like abdominal bloating, breast tenderness, and headaches. It's a PMS. But some critics claim that such symptoms are typical features of menstruation. Is it a disease or is it not? Uh, uh, all of these pains. So how do we how do we determine what is a normal feature of menstruation? How much of of um, that normality is uh, it includes what would typically uh, hinder normal performance in the workday? My God fatigue and abdominal, abdominal bloating. I mean, yo, know, gases can be very painful, <laughs> whether it's from period cramps or whatever, um, or, or abdominal bloating from your period or from whatever cause, that's, that can be a lot. 
um, take and then you take into consideration um, the cramps. Jesus, it'll put you on your ass, you know. Um, so someone could be experiencing extreme pain, but that might be kind of normal for for a period, you know. But when you compare that normality to the norm, the normality necessary to perform in this capitalistic society, um, you know. That that can be that can be a lot, um, and it can put you in a, a bad headspace. So, anyways, controversy about psychiatric diseases can arise from disputes about the general nature of disease. Consider the claim that critics make about premenstrual dysphoric disorder. If one is a normativist about disease, uh, all that matters in holding that premenstrual dysphoric disorder is a genuine disease is that it causes some women to suffer. That alone warrants calling it a genuine disease, says the normativist. How would a naturalist respond to this? Well, depends on how you take natural fact. <laughs> just Let's just send all the women to the, to the period tent until they're done bleeding and then they can come back into society. You know, let's... Ah, so how seriously are we going to take normal human functioning uh, is normal human functioning, is that something that needs to be relieved from time to time? I think so. We, we invented headache medicine. Sheesh. And the good Lord put weed on this earth. If that doesn't help with your menstrual cramps, I don't know. Well, well. Uh, okay. Culture-bound disease, and then we're done. Culture-bound syndromes, as you say. Page 89, some diseases seem to occur only in very particular contexts. For example, one of the first causes of multiple personality disorder was in the 1960s. And in the 1980s, many thousands of cases of multiple personality disorder were diagnosed in the U.S. But then the frequency of cases dropped off. And now the DSM does not even list multiple personality disorder as a uh, disease oh my goodness um we have another example we just go uh, again philosophy textbooks are off the wall Ex wild example from here left field then completely in another baseball diamond from a completely different left field we have a more recent example is up given head syndrome or refugee resignation syndrome which exists only in Sweden and only among refugees and only among children and adolescents and only in the past two decades. Symptoms include withdrawal from daily life as well as a lack of eating and talking and hygiene. And the cause typically involves trouble with the refugee family maintaining legal residency status in Sweden. The examples that I started this chapter with, DOT syndrome, how would be young, female sexual arousal disorder, and running amok. I skipped over that, didn't I? Our culture-bound syndromes. There are many of these alleged diseases throughout the world. Such diseases are controversial. The Swedish refugee resignation syndrome is a good example. Critics of the practice of diagnosing refugee children with the syndrome claim that the children are faking the symptoms in order to help their families attain legal residency in Sweden. Defenders of the practice retort that such critics are xenophobic and racist. The admission that culture can be responsible for the existence of a disease, or at least important features of a disease, is troubling for the view that diseases are simply objective and natural features of the world. You know, maybe those kids are depressed over in Sweden. Maybe we don't, we don't need this hyper-refined, very specific disease. But then again, maybe we do. Um, maybe if we are to be holistic, very specific bounds for evaluation are necessary so that we can attach all those different parts of life to this very specific uh, potential disease refugee resignation, resignation syndrome, and we'll be able to better uh, do something about it with laser focus. Some might take a different view and say, you know, uh, 
that's that's ridiculous. Uh, a syndrome is a syndrome. A disease is a disease. Uh, to to be culture bound, that that's not a real disease. You know. Uh, okay. Last, we have addiction. Honestly, I think uh, it's stigmatized, and it shouldn't be. Um, I think trauma is a gateway drug to addiction. Um, you know, folks will go back and forth about whether we should have safe spaces for folks to use, um, or if that's just not enabling folks. I don't know. I work with Bethesda Project here with the Lawn Chair, Fa uh, Lawn Chair Philosophy Foundation. Um, they are a network of housing shelters here in Philly that take a home first approach to um, those afflicted with housing issues, which means that you don't have to be completely sober in order to have a bed there. Um, there are many shelters who that uh, make folks prove that they are sober and have been sober so that they can get a bed. Uh, the folks at Bethesda go, well, how on earth are you going to get sober without um, without the security of, of a roof over your head first? If I'm out on the streets and I don't know where my, where, if I'm going to be uh, sleeping in the car or, you know, on the sidewalk or wherever, I'm going to drink too or take whatever money you give me and get whatever I need with it, you know? So I think a, an holistic approach should be taken when it comes to addiction and a medical one as well. You know, uh, it's not just a moral issue. It's some folks are deep into their addiction and to just cut off cold turkey is dangerous. So please let's, let's take into consideration um, the physical body, it's chemical makeup, uh, uh, what chemical dependency looks like versus habit. Um, let's just be kind to each other. That's, that's, you know, do the reading, of course, but for heaven's sakes. All right. Um, where is the Zoom button? All right. I'll link those websites for you. And um, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you for, for bearing with this more relaxed ending. The rest of the semester is going to be good. <laughs>